Um, so yes, I'm the senior archaeologist covering um, the Midlands patch for the Environment Agency. This is just a little bit of the PhD research I did at the University of Birmingham um, that I finished in 2019. It's been a while since I've done any kind of academic stuff, so I am academically adrift, but um, basically I use, my, I use my research in my everyday work with the Environment Agency, and I'm quite happy doing that. Um, so this session, we're looking at how you might articulate heritage value through the language and discourse of sustainable development. And what I'm hoping to show is that sustainable development discourse has actually already heavily influenced the heritage sector in terms of our language, and this has in turn changed our philosophy and our practice. And it has promoted certain heritage values and approaches to heritage valuation. And that's a horrible plug for my PhD, which is free and open access. So... When I first started my PhD in 2011, um, I came across quite a nice accessible book on um, uh, the sustain sustainability uh, paradigm. And it was basically by Andre Edwards in 2015, and he calls it the prehistory of sustainable development. So sustainable development didn't just arrive as a fully developed discourse and approach. Um, there is a prehistory to it. And part of that is in the 19th and the early 20th century, environmental protection and conservation was linked to things like human spirituality and emotional and physical well-being. You've obviously got things like the founding of the National Trust in 1895 to preserve land and properties of historic interest or of natural beauty. In the US, you've got John Muir and the interconnectedness of human culture and nature, with humans drawing inspiration and spiritual well-being from nature. And this eventually led to the establishment of national parks, which are supposedly areas untouched by humans, but as we know, most areas in some shape or form have been touched by areas, by areas, by humans. <laughs> um, and that there's very few actually truly natural areas. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, um, we introduced the notion of practical conservation. So this was basically the conservation of renewable resources like timber, um, and this was because basically their management became quite critical to the recovery of various na nations following the uh, Second World War. By the time you get to the 1960s, we've got advances in scientific evidence. Um, we could no longer claim ignorance. Um, an action needed to be taken to start to remedy the environmental degradation and pollution before the carrying capacity of the Earth's biosphere was reached, exceeded, and damaged beyond its natural assimilation capacity. And so you've got um, publications like Silent Spring, which talks about basically the loss of biodiversity, loss of insects, birds, and essentially all these sounds that we associate with spring, hence your Silent Spring. You've also got the start of grassroots environmentalism to address the environmental crisis. And I know that that language has started to come back. Um, and it's an intensifying discourse, um, and it's certainly not new. But you had things like the first Earth Day back in 1970. And just a kind of a growing anxiety around um, environmental degradation, um, the emergence of what Ulrich Beck calls the Risk Society. So that's a way of dealing with this anxiety that's brought about by threats to modern life now and in the future, and that are actually to a large extent caused by societal modernization itself. And we've certainly carried some of this language of risk into heritage management, and I used to work for the Heritage at Risk program. So the environment is considered to be both of intrinsic value, that is, it's valued in and of itself, and also as an instrument for human development as well as a natural resource um, for its links to cultural and social value. And the kind of discursive themes that you get out of this period is environmental limits, a fragile environment. You've got the first pictures of Earth from space. We realize that, you know, essentially we are alone in at least our planetary system, if not much further afield. Um, and the need for protection and preservation to prevent loss of nature, conservation of resources, and basically prudent use of um, finite resources. So by 1984, you've got um, the publication Our Common Future, which I think most people will recognize as really being what puts sustainable development on the map. Um, and you see actually a semantic shift from hard limits to limitations that could be overcome by technology and development. So instead of development being seen as the issue, it became part of the solution. 
and it emphasised the balancing of intergenerational needs. It drew upon ecological modernisation discourse, which was a win-win rhetoric, best captured in the Venn diagram. And it stresses that measures to curb or mitigate pollution from industry would not lead to losses in terms of economic capital, but instead it would give gains from operations becoming more efficient, competitive, and especially within newly emergent green markets. So essentially it was a greening of capitalism and industry, and using the markets to, I will say, mostly unsuccessfully dictate changes to improved environmental protection and conservation rather than imposing sanctions and tightening regulatory measures. So our common future advocated for the polluter to pays principle, which we're all well aware of, um, and that reflects a shift from protection and restriction to mitigation and management of environmental harm through voluntary arrangements and market-based approaches. And the intention behind this approach was to internalize the cost of environmental protection within industry and businesses and away from national governments. This is essentially how we made rescue archaeology financially self-sustaining and created a new market for commercial archaeology as part of the development process. So again, the kind of things that we're getting out of this period um, is balancing of different and often competing needs, development and technology as a solution to environmental degradation rather than the problem, the idea that polluters can pay to pollute, um, and then despite being hailed as a new approach to environmentalism, I'll say that sustainable development was essentially a buzzword that enabled the continuation of the status quo and the Western capitalist mythos of indefinite growth with a green veneer. Um, it's no coincidence that periodically there is a renewed interest to actually operationalise sustainable forms of development. And in the 1990s, you got Agenda 21 Action Plan as well. So in the 19th century, political economist John Stuart Mill advocated for the role of the state in protection through regulation of what would later be termed commons and public goods. Um, these were considered to be external to market forces, but were the common inheritance of all the human race. And indeed, this rhetoric was adopted by the heritage sector, particularly in the concept of world heritage. So by the time you have the mid-20th century, there's various approaches that were developed to bring the environment into, bring the, environment into the market. And you get environmental economics um, that continue to consider the environment as an externality with no market value that needed to be brought into the market um, by being able to assess their value alongside other sectors and also creating new markets where none previously existed. The flip side to that is there is also another approach to economics that we don't necessarily hear about anymore, and that's ecological economics, that saw the economy as a subsystem of the biosphere and focused on the co-evolution of economic and natural systems that would have in turn been influenced by social and cultural systems. By the time we get to the 1990s, um, a national approaching, a national, apologize. <laughs> <coughs> A national accounting approach to environmental auditing was established in the UK, advocating for environmental economics approach. It proposed that the monetization of environmental resources and services, but it actually emphasized that this was not to reduce their value to money, but rather to provide a standardized measuring rod by which they could be compared with other resources and sectors within a national accounting framework. As highlighted by earlier economic thinking, natural services that might be considered free or commons, that is, no market exists for them, tend to be more in demand, but demand can outstrip supply or um, capacity to meet demands. And by bringing them into the market, it was believed that environmental resources and services could be appropriately valued and therefore adequately controlled to ensure their sustainable management and continued availability. It was suggested that with time, any natural resource could generate a market, but that without proactive intervention, this might happen at the point when the resource is near to being exhausted, with a market being created through scarcity, and this is a phenomenon called, um, known as the tragedy of the commons. It's interesting, again, that the establishment of commercial archaeology from rescue archaeology followed this trend. There was a whole new sector created following heavily publicised losses. So again, the kind of things that we're seeing here is bringing the environment and other externalities into the market, and cultural heritage was very much also seen as an externality, as well as a form of commons and public good. 
I want to briefly touch upon the fact that I um, haven't really necessarily mentioned culture, but culture has been included in the concept of sustainable development as a system of value as well as the tangible outputs and expressions of those values. Um, and this culminated in the 1995 publication, Our Creative Diversity. Despite rejecting the idea of the value of culture should not be reduced to economic value and being cautious about the commercialization of heritage, resource management and economics featured heavily in cultural sustainability discourse that championed the creation of new markets such as cultural tourism and the production of craft goods based on traditional material culture. There's been various initiatives and conferences over the last 30 years calling for culture to be considered a key element of sustainable development and to be formally incorporated into sustainable development goals. The lack of specific sustainable development goals in relation to culture has often been seen as a failing by the international campaign, but what this actually ignores is the fact that culture, if understood as a valuation framework and worldview, inevitably impacts upon and shapes all the sustainable development goals. What I believe is actually being lamented by international and national cultural heritage bodies is a lack of reference to very specific types of culture that heritage management frameworks seek to protect. So that sites contributing to national heritage narratives and agendas with international sites con um, considered to be a form of global commons. This is because for the sustainability and long-term endurance of these heritage management frameworks, they require justification for their patronage by demonstrating their continuing relevance and importance to governments and society. And the sustainable development goals are the latest metric favoured to demonstrate that. Not having, to, not having a specific category means that we actually need to make the case for the contribution of heritage, and this is what's been brought up by various speakers. But maybe this will actually make us think more critically about that and it highlights what's perceived to be an enduring policy problem for cultural heritage, that the intangible value of heritage cannot be easily captured by the kinds of metrics favoured in reporting on progress for sustainable development goals and also national government accounting. Um, the success of environmental sustainability discourse in the way it was mainstreamed into all sectors of government and public life appealed to the heritage sector, which had struggled to find the same level of support and financial aid. Some of the themes highlighted from the development of a discourse and language around sustainable development will almost certainly be familiar to the heritage sector. This is not a coincidence, but it was deliberately done to align heritage management with the resource management side of sustainability in the 1990s. In 1997, following on, a detailed, following on from a detailed study on the applicability of environmental economics to heritage value and auditing, Graham Fairclough, on behalf of English Heritage, highlighted that we accept the intrinsic value of natural environment in relation to wildlife and commons as global goods, but when it came to cultural values, these were seen as less absolute. This sentiment has been rearticulated numerous times since. Um, that by bringing historic elements of the environment into a whole environment framework, this would extend the intrinsic value of the natural environment to the historic and cultural aspects to help us justify the resources needed to protect and enhance them. And what I will say is intrinsic value is a much more nuanced concept than the example I've given, um, but I, I don't have time to unpack that in 15 minutes. Um, but heritage values are diverse and they differ between cultural and social contexts. And those values are not unequivocal. And this is why um, it's so hard to track, audit, and articulate them in economic terms, which in turn makes them difficult to integrate into national accounting frameworks for the purposes of allocating budgets. Um, and again, as we've heard, to gain political support. In terms of how our heritage was characterized as an environmental resource, specifically archaeological resources were compared to finite, non-renewable environmental resources. Although many have since challenged this, and some actually see the historic environment as a renewable resource. Um, it also introduced the notion of a fragile and a vulnerable historic environment to support the argument for better management of impacts from development. Although again, we're now less wedded to the idea of preservation, um, and we're even open to the idea of letting things go, and we've got the, the emerging concept of adaptive release. So despite the desire for a simpler intrinsic value attached to the historic environment, these early discussion documents really make it clear that in the end, value and significance of heritage comes down to people's socially and culturally informed perceptions and opinions. And no matter how useful intrinsic value was to help justify funding, it was never going to reflect the reality that heritage value is ascribed, whether that's officially or unofficially.
And we may have a collection of material and processes called heritage, but the value of that is not a given. It's not static. It's not intrinsic. It's not inherent to the materials and the practices. It's never going to be reduced to a neat consensus between groups and individuals, let alone one that can be economically captured in a way that's not completely reductive. And this would then in turn lead to a loss of value or limiting the types of values that are being articulated. But we'll try, we'll continue to try. Um, and obviously there's still the ongoing research for cultural capital, but I do find that quite interesting that cultural capital is a corruption of um, Bodger's much more useful concept of cultural capital, um, which is essentially why someone like myself is here today talking about this stuff with a PhD. Um, and basically the sociology of cultural capital and essentially how culture can help people in terms of social mobility, access to jobs, prospects, that kind of thing. Okay. What I am going to focus on a very small aspect, I appreciate again, this is incredibly, my, my presentation itself is reductive um, because we don't have enough time. Um, but in adopting the language of sustainable development for national accounting and auditing in relation to heritage, the one thing that really appeared to the national, appealed to the national government was the idea that heritage itself might be self-sustaining. Um, and please note that self-sustaining is not the same as it being sustainable, because something might be sustainable, but it might not necessarily endure in the long term. We successfully created a heritage industry of attractions, experiences, and increasingly tea rooms. And certain types of heritage destination were very successful. And obviously, you've got the national trust model. But this isn't going to work for everything. A second thread to this was built heritage as a premium property, utilizing sustainability discourse on resource recycling and renewal as part of regeneration agendas. This effectively created a new market for historic properties where dividends were paid for their pleasing historic um, aesthetics. And whilst this also took care of a crumbling building stock, there have been issues of displacement of existing communities and rising prices forcing people out. So even, and I would say even supposedly um, socially sustainable approaches to heritage and heritage participation can sometimes be seen as creating exclusive markets around the purchasing of experiences. So economic value and monetization as a, as a measuring rod for national accounting is not necessarily an issue, but we do need to accompany these with more nuanced qualitative approaches to capturing and understanding the cultural and social value of heritage, or even, as people have talked about, the absence of it. These skills are woefully lacking within the heritage sector, um, and it is more than just surveys. We need to, we need to train people in having meaningful conversations. When we borrow language and valuation approaches from other disciplines, we should be critically appraising what this is doing in terms of our own philosophy and practice, and any biases it may be introducing. It may appear to be beneficial in the short term to bring us in line with other disciplines or new approaches, but in the long term, it could set our discipline back in terms of our own understanding and articulation of the cultural value and relevance of what we do. And many forget that people are actually the most critical thing about heritage, not stuff. Um, I've observed the way that some international and national organizations talk about built and tangible heritage, especially that perceived to be in danger, as though the heritage is an entity that has needs in and of itself. And this sets up heritage managers as having an ethical responsibility to material rather than human needs, and indeed the human rights that might be violated around and even through heritage management frameworks. In this respect, we might well take a look at environmental justice rather than revisiting sustainable development language to ensure that we do not continue deeply ingrained biases in terms of how we value and encourage others to value heritage. Thank you.